I find if I don't wait, then um, the start of my sermon gets cut off, so I'll wait and stare back there until Richie turns on the camera. Luke chapter 2, first seven verses. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths, in the King James, that is swaddling clothes, or swaddling cloths, and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. No room in the inn in the King James. Would you bow your heads with me? Dear Lord, we thank you this morning for the privilege of bringing these morsels of your word to the family in this house this morning. And we pray that you will, that you will bless the word to the people today in Jesus' name. Amen. So, he was wrapped in swaddling clothes. Um, some have thought that the swaddling clothes were burial cloths. Did you ever hear that theory? Some people think that. A study of the Greek shows that's not so. Some have said that these were rags. The penguins that taught us in school told us that they were rags. But the Greek word is Sparganu. I don't know how, I'm sure, not sure how to pronounce that, but that's how it looks. And so the significance of that Greek word Sparganu, from which the swaddling clothes is translated, is in Luke 2 12. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths, swaddling clothes in the King James, and lying in a manger. The sign identifying the baby as the Messiah was that he would be wrapped in some translated as baby clothes but it depicts swaddling bands swaddling is an ancient practice of wrapping infants in a blanket or similar cloth so that the movement of the limbs is tightly restricted I remember when our children were born and the nurses said, wrap them up tight in a baby blanket because they're used to being in the womb of their mother all bound up and they're more secure. And so we wrapped them up tightly. Did you do that with your kids, any of, any of you? I'm the only one. <laughs> That's what the nurses told. Of course, that was over 50 years ago. But, uh, but anyway, they said, yeah, they like to be bound up like that for the first few days. Also, their fingernails grow so fast, they'll scratch their face if they, you know. So, swaddling is an ancient practice. And uh, swaddling bands, they were called, were often used to further restrict the infant. Swaddling fell out of favor in the 17th century. I guess nobody told the nurses about that, that it was out of favor when our kids were born, but we did that, and they seemed to be content with that, just for a few days. In the Native American, some of the Native, Native American nations would, uh, they would swaddle um, on a board, and they put the baby in a pouch, and then they wrapped bands around it, and the mother carried the baby on her back on that board. You could call that swaddling. Um, they could take the board off and lean it against a tree or, so, or hang it up, which some of them, I, I think, did, to keep them protected. And since many people had to leave home and travel to the town of their ancestors, it's most likely that Mary's family gave her some 
cloths, clothes, swaddling, whatever you want to call it, for Jesus or for the infant that was going to be born, something to wrap him in. What is really significant is that Jesus was also in a manger, which is what we think of as an as a um, animal trough. They still use that term manger um, in, in a dairy barn. That's a manger where they put the, the grain and the hay. Anyway, Jesus lay in an animal trough and wrapped in swaddling clothes would be an incredible sign to the shepherds. So maybe Mary brought those swaddling clothes with her. There's another theory. This is, I find this fascinating. Uh, this comes from, from the research of Cooper Abrams. And this is a theory. Some scholars don't agree, but there are ec these are excerpts from his report where it says, Clear this, clearly the city of Jesus' birth was Bethlehem, as Mi Micah 5, 2 prophesied, and as the Gospels of Matthew, Luke, and John confirm. Luke proclaims the birth place as Bethlehem, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. 1 Samuel 17, 15 confirms Bethlehem as the city of David. David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. That was the city of David. But where in Bethlehem was Jesus born? The fact is that the New Testament doesn't say the exact place in Bethlehem where Jesus was born. Nowhere does the Bible record that he was born in a stable attended by donkeys, chickens, and cows as the nativity scenes present but in the past it was speculated that because there was no room for Joseph and Mary in the inn that he was born in the stable behind the inn where the animals were kept and that that's that's a teaching that you hear a lot about all the New Testament specifically says is that, that he was laid in a manger and that it was in Bethlehem the only reason for us to think that Jesus was born in a stable is the, is the use of the word manger. We think that if there's a manger, there must be animals, and that where the animals are, there is a stable. It seems to make sense, but maybe not. The popular conception that the word manger refers to a trough where animals were fed may be accurate, however, it can also mean a stall. It can be translated as a stall. The Greek word that is translated in our Bibles as manger is yetin fatne. And the definition of that word is of a stall where animals are kept. In Luke 13, 15, it's translated, this is the same word as manger, it's translated this way. The Lord answered him, You hypocrites, doesn't each of you on the Sabbath day untie your ox or donkey from the stall and lead it out to give it water? That stall word is the same word in Greek that is translated as a manger. There, when you look at the Greek, there are other possibilities than the traditional thoughts that we might have. In the Septuagint Greek, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the word means a stall or a crib. In Proverbs 14, 4, it says, Where there are no oxen, the manger is empty, but from the strength of an ox comes abundant harvest. So that word can be a stall or it can be a manger. The question is, what kind of a stall or manger in the New Testament uh, is referring to and what kind of animal was fed or housed there? That's a question. And although the New Testament does not tell us where in Bethlehem Jesus was born, I'm still reading from this researcher now. 
The Old Testament does. Micah 4, 8 says, And thou, O tower of the flock, a stronghold of the daughter of Zion, unto thee it shall come, even the first dominion, the kingdom shall come to the daughter of Jerusalem. Thus, the Old Testament clearly states that the Messiah would be born at the tower of the flock. In the Hebrew, that is Migdal Adar. Isn't that fascinating? Maybe it's boring to you. I hope not. <laughs> but it says he would be born in the tower of the flock. It must be noted that Ephrath or Ephratha was the ancient name for the area that later was called Bethlehem. According to Genesis 35, 19, after Jacob buried Rachel, he moved his flocks beyond the Tower of Adar, or Migdal Adar. The location of Rachel's tomb today is outside, on the outskirts of present-day Bethlehem. But clearly it was not when Jacob buried his wife there. Clearly, the area which is called Bethlehem in biblical times covered a greater area than does present-day Bethlehem and the tower of the flock, Migdal Adar, was in that city. It seems that Migdal Adar was the watchtower that guarded the temple flocks that were being raised to serve as sacrificial animals in the temple. As you know, those lambs had to be spotless. They had to be perfect. And the, 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 this, um, this tower uh, was where these lambs were kept. The shepherds who kept them were men who were specifically trained for that royal task. Uh, they were educated in what an animal uh, that was to be sacrificed had to be and it was their job to make sure that none of the animals were hurt damaged or blemished in other words the lambs were apparently well they could have been wrapped in swaddling cloths to keep them from being blemished or dirty or anything like that to protect it from injury and that could have been the same things that, that wrapped the Lord Jesus in this setting, Micah 4, 8, uses the prophecy of the Babylonian captivity of the southern kingdom. I'm not going to go into what that was, but that was, the, that was Nebuchadnezzar. As a pledge to guarantee the birth of Christ at Migdal Adar, at Bethlehem. In other words, that strong tower at Bethlehem, which is exactly where it took place in the opinion of this author. Micah prophesied that as surely as the Assyrians would soon carry away Israel in the north, so the Messiah would come and establish his kingdom, the first dominion. It's in that prophecy. The kingdom shall come to Jerusalem. The verse states that as surely as Babylon would carry away the tribe of Judah in the south, into captivity so the messiah would arrive at the tower of the flock migdal edar this prophecy was one other evidence that later proved that jesus was the messiah but one that israel ignored in rejecting his their messiah so jesus was born in migdal edar which is the strong tower that was where it was predicted that he would be born. We know why he was born there. There was no room for them in the inn. We don't know how many inns there might have been in Bethlehem, but no one could accommodate them. There was no room. They needed a safe place to birth the child. Micah prophesied that the Messiah would be born in the watchtower. Migdal Adar, which was at Bethlehem, also prophesied. There were shepherds nearby. It was their tower used for the birthing of sacrificial lambs. 
Isn't that interesting? And Jesus was born there. Jesus, the ultimate sacrificial lamb, was born in the strong tower, Magdal Adar, where these sacrificial lambs were born and taken care of. And Jesus is the strong tower to all who would have him. Mary and Joseph needed a safe place to bring an infant into the world. Before Constantine, the holy site was known as the, that was known as the Nativity Grotto, is thought to be the cave in which Jesus was born. In 135 AD, the Emperor Hadrian had the site above the grotto converted into a worship place for Adonis, the mortal lover of Aphrodite, the Greek goddess of beauty and desire. Jerome claimed in 420 AD that the grotto had been consecrated uh, to the worship of Adonis and that a sacred grove was planted there in order to completely wipe out the memory of Jesus from the world. Around AD 248, Greek philosopher Origen of Alexandria wrote the following about the grotto. In Bethlehem, a cave is pointed out where he was born and the manger in the cave where he was wrapped in swaddling clothes. And the rumor is in those places and among foreigners of the faith that indeed Jesus was born in this cave who was worshiped and reverenced by Christians. So in 248 years approximately after Jesus was born, this cave or grotto uh, was indicated as most likely the birthplace of Jesus. There was a church built over it and it's called the Church of the Nativity. So that was, a, that, that was 248 years after he was born. That was uh, when that place was indicated. You know, um, when Constantine became Christian. His mother, Helena, was already Christian. And she went to the Holy Land and tried to find all the sites where things took place. The birth of Jesus, the, the crucifixion site. And they built, uh, she, had, she and, and her son, Constantine, had churches built over those sites. But that was a long time after it happened. And maybe those places were so. And maybe they weren't but my conclusion is that the strong tower could have been built around the grotto which is where the church of the nativity marks the place where jesus is thought to have been born if they could build and i looked i looked it up this this church is a three-sided church built up against that grotto so the grotto is inside of the church if the grotto could, be, grotto could be inside of the church, then the grotto could have been in, a, in the strong tower that was built there. It was incorporated into the strong tower. The grotto could have been an interior safe place. And the infant grew up to be the perfect sacrificial lamb. The only sacrifice that could pay the penalty for my sins and all sins of mankind, now he is the strong tower. We can run to him and be safe. Proverbs 18.10, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. His name is a strong tower. God provides a wonderful and strong defense. This is rooted not in magical saying of his name as if it was a charm or a spell, but in the name of the Lord is a declaration of his character, his person, in all that he is and all that he stands for. Yahweh, the Lord is a strong tower. 
This is the only place in Proverbs where the name of the Lord is found. It signifies the attributes of God, here the power to protect. And because the name of Yahweh represents his character in all its aspects, the believer can think about the aspects of God's character and find a strong, safe refuge in God's character, a strong tower that we can go to and be safe. It can be as simple as this, Lord, you are a God of love, so I find refuge in your love. Lord, you're a God of mercy, so I find refuge in your mercy. Lord, you're a God of strength, so I find refuge in your strength when I don't have any. Lord, you're a God of righteousness, so I find strength in your righteousness when I don't have any. A strong tower. Within these walls, which, which of us needs to worry about the sharpest arrow that can harm us? Within these walls, we realize our security from external trouble as we exercise our faith. We're safe from God's avenging justice. We're safe from the curse of the law, from sin, from condemnation, and from the second death. The righteous run to it and are safe. God invites all to find refuge in his name. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Those who humbly run to God and find refuge with him are his righteous ones. So it is the righteous who run to it. We're only righteous because he imparts his righteousness onto us. All creatures run to their refuges when hunted. Run therefore to God by praying and not fainting. This is the best policy for security run to it this running appears to imply that they have nothing to carry the person who has a load the heavier the load may be the more will be impacted or impeded in his running and his flight but the righteous run like racers in the games who have thrown off everything their sins they leave to mercy and their righteousness to the moles and bats. That's from Spurgeon, the great theologian. The only problem that so many still have, no room for him. So many have no room in their hearts, no room in their lives, no room for his grace, no room for his authority, and no room for his love, the tragedy of life is that most people refuse him. They trample the perfect gift of God underfoot. I can remember being that way. But what about us believers? Our actions should demonstrate to the world around us that our love for him comes first over anything else that we experience. Are we too busy for him? Life is full of stuff, full of distractions, problems at work, problems at home, problems raising children, problems with teenagers. You've all done that, raised teenagers. <laughs> You've all, all of you have had that experience, raising teenagers. That's one of the, one of the most interesting parts of life. Got to take care of this, got to take care of that, got to go here, got to go there. Got to get some of this, got to get some of that. Busy, 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 got to get this done. Proverbs 3, 6, in all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. Give it all to God. Do you close him out? Is there room for him in all of our waking hours? Think about that. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, 
for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. At first, that might seem impossible, but God wouldn't advise it if it were impossible to pray, it says in the King James, without ceasing. Does that mean you constantly have a prayer coming out, constantly? No, it means that you don't ever cease having a prayer life. That's what that means. You might pray once a day, you might pray twice a day, you might pray three times a day, but don't abandon your prayer life. That's what prayer, that's what ceasing is if you stop having the prayer life. Is there room for him in your, in your thoughts? Do we carry our love for him in our constant thinking? We carry our loved ones in our constant thinking. So why not God? Is there room for him in your prayer life? Do we even have a prayer life? Do we only pray when we need something? Some of us only pray when we, when we need something or when someone asks us to pray because they need something. Do we only pray when we're in trouble? Just because we're mature believers doesn't mean we never get in trouble. <laughs> there's, there, there's snares set before everybody that's a believer. Trouble of this kind of trouble of that kind, trying to distract us and get us to think negatively. Does our prayer time consist of only requests? Or do we give time for God to make an impression in our hearts of something that we should do or something that we should think? Is there room for him in our worship? Are we only singing songs when we worship? Where do the songs come from? Do we worship when we tithe, when we give God a tenth of our increase? what the Bible calls it, our increase. Are we demonstrative? How do we show God how much we love him? How do we show each other? Hugs, you know? That's a demonstrative. You know, I can't sit across the room and say I love you, and, but I'm not going to get anywhere near you unless you have frankalosis or something like that. <laughs> My grandmother... <laughs> came here from Sweden and she'd say, get away, don't touch that, you'll get frankalosis. And she, of course she made that up. It was, so I touched it anyway, but I didn't get frankalosis. So how do we show God how much we love him? It's a question for you, it's a question for each one of us. Psalm 98, four and six, shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. Well, we're part of the earth, so we're supposed to do that. Make music to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the sound of singing, with trumpets and the blast of the ram's horn. Shout for joy before the Lord the King. In Luke 19.40, I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Do you want stones to do your worshiping for you? <laughs> do you want the stones to do your worshiping so why do we care about whether it was a cave or a stable or whatever why do we care about that it doesn't matter what matters is that Jesus came was born in humble circumstances lived a perfect sinless life died on the cruel cross of Calvary to pay the penalty for my sins and for yours. What matters is that Jesus fulfilled every Old Testament prophecy about the coming Messiah. What matters is that God's Holy Spirit brings conviction into the heart of a sinner. Do you remember? I do. I sure do. What matters is that we can come to repentance and turn away from our life of sin. What matters is that Jesus sets us free from the law of sin and death. These are the things that matter, not whether he was born in a stable. It doesn't matter. He was born in humble circumstances. That is true. What matters is that Jesus is coming back soon, I think. 
seems that way what matters is that we need to live for God and be ready for him so what should I do get saved stay saved carry the gospel and live for God amen, amen. would you stand is there anyone in the house that needs prayer today if so come down and we'll pray